through high school, and then I went to University of Pennsylvania, and my family moved to Wilmington in 39, and that's when I went to medical school. Being from a family of doctors, I was always expected to be a doctor, but I was a terrible student. I'm dyslexic, and of course, in those days, they didn't know what that was. You were either stupid or lazy or both. And so when I graduated in Penn with difficulty, I said, no use going to medical school, I wouldn't last. So I went to work for several years, and that was a very sobering influence. And then uh, one day I took a, a, a aptitude test at Stevens Institute, which they were just starting. And they said, uh, what you're doing as a salesman, you're not cut out for. Go to medical school, never try to read, just memorize the professor's notes and you won't have any trouble. So I did that. I never had any trouble getting through medical school. We graduated during the war years. I graduated in 43. And uh, I guess I was leaning to obstetrics and gynecology, but then when I went in the Army, I got assigned to ophthalmology, which I had never would have thought of in medical school. And I had two years of Army duty in ophthalmology. And I began to learn something about it, liked it, and continued. It was slow. I think I remember making $5 my first month. And uh, but I opened up a, my own practice, and then uh, a Dr. William Lamont Jr., who was my age and training, and we got together and formed a partnership, and, uh, and then we built the professional building, which was out near Wanamaker's, and ran that for a while, and. Uh, we had about 40 doctors in the building, so it was a big operation. At that time, there were 100, uh, I think 120 doctors practicing within a block of the Medical Arts Building on Delaware Avenue. Nobody had ever gone to the suburbs, and the real estate people later told me, we thought you were crazy. <laughs> and uh, it was a little difficult getting the buildings filled up at first, but eventually we did. And, uh, yeah, and then, of course, everybody went suburban after that. And uh, so I, I, I think I sold the building by 1973. I've often thought about that. There were two cases that stuck in my mind. When I was an intern at the Delaware Hospital, and one was a family who had a, a beautiful two-year-old boy, and he was riding in the car with his father, and he slumped over unconscious. And Dr. Wagner was the, the pediatrician, a tremendous guy. And I remember we called him at three o'clock in the morning. He came in to see the little boy. We never could find out why he died, which was tragic. We thought, of course, first of all, he was diabetic, but he wasn't. We never knew what caused him to die. It always stuck in my mind. Another patient, I was on emergency there, and they brought in about a 45, 50-year-old woman, and she, she lived out in the country and was diagnosed as diabetic, and her country doctor she went to said, oh, you're not diabetic. Well, she came in with a blood sugar of about 700 and some unconscious, of course, and she died before we could resurrect her. I was always disappointed in those two cases, but they had nothing to do with ophthalmology. Well, when we started practice, none of the ophthalmologists uh, dispensed glasses. There were opticians in town, and they all went to them. Uh, later years, that changed. The doctors started hiring opticians in their offices and dispensing. We never did. We didn't think it was ethical, but uh, it was lucrative for the doctor. 
to dispense glasses. So that, that was a big change. Uh, I don't think ophthalmology changed that much otherwise. Uh, it, there are many subspecialties now in, a, in ophthalmology. Harley was one. He was the first pediatric ophthalmologist in this country, having formed a department at St. Christopher's Hospital in 1956, and later at Willis Eye. Then he came to Wilmington. Uh, oddly enough, I was at an American Ophthalmology Society meeting, and we were lined up for lunch, I remember one day, and. My wife, uh, my, we're Quakers. My wife heard the doctor in front of him saying he was a Quaker. <laughs> so she introduced herself to him, and that was Dr. Harley. And uh, then he came to Wilmington, and then subsequently married my secretary, Lucille, and he was the first in that space. Now we have a lot of other subspecialties, uh, retinal specialists who do the, any retinal surgery diagnosis and so on. And now we even have glaucoma specialists and uh, even one or two vascular specialists in ophthalmology out of Wales. You know. So I think every field of medicine has gone through this. Uh, more and more subspecialties. Well, the, the library, of course, I use, I guess, mostly. And the meetings, uh, they, uh, the meetings that they always had, I attended. Uh, I suppose that's the main thing, yeah. Oh, uh, Delaware was, University of Delaware was considering building a medical school. I would, I don't know how many years ago, maybe 20 or 30, or must be longer ago than that, 30 years ago. At that time, they estimated it would cost $70 million to build a medical school. Today, it would cost oh, many, many times that. But at that time, Jefferson came along and said, if you don't build a medical school, we will save 20 slots every year for Delaware graduates to our first freshman class in medical school. And at that time, Dimer paid the tuition too, I think. In later years, uh, uh, they subsidized the students, I believe, through loans, non-interest-bearing loans. But uh, they still had to pay the tuition. And uh, that was a tremendous boon to, uh, you know, because Jefferson, Oh, they have, what, 7,000 applicants a year. And to take 20 students and guarantee them a spot, and there weren't that many applicants. Well, I don't think there were more than 70 or 80, as I recall, at any one year. And that's a tremendous percentage of acceptances out of that number of applicants versus uh, class of maybe 200 coming out of 7,000 applicants otherwise. And the hope was that the physicians from Delaware graduated would come back to Delaware to practice. And I think a large percentage of them did. You know. Medicine has changed, of course, tremendously, as we all know. And, uh, I think the academy and the medical side have to change with it, and I think they are, as far as I can gather. Yeah. The, the quality of medicine has improved tremendously as a result. You know. They don't know their patients well, but they do an excellent job. And uh, so many innovations, and I think we're just beginning to see them too. I'd love to see what the next 40 or 50 years will bring. but. For instance, I wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for cardiac care. And I believe cardiac deaths were the largest cause of deaths a few years ago. Now it's cancer. But I've had, you know, 
angioplasty on my third pacemaker. I said to him, they put in a pacemaker. I said, what happened the days before a pacemaker? Oh, you'd be dead. He said, it's true. So the quality of medicine has actually improved tremendously, you know. And I, I do a paper on, uh, sometimes on the killer flu of 1918. And you know, there are estimated 25 million people died in the world from the, that flu. And we lost more soldiers in World War II from the flu than were actually killed in battle. The Keystone Pennsylvania Division lost 71 soldiers killed or missing in action. Four, you know, 770 patients, I believe, died from the flu. Not, never saw the battle or anything.